it's a, it's a fascinating phenomenon that when organized anything neglects something that the that society in general feels is appropriate, um, grassroots start to uh, grassroots activity starts out, and this is exactly what happened in the hospice movement in the United States and in Exeter. A group of people decided that it was something that was needed, that end-of-life care needed to be attended to. I was working as, uh, at Exeter Hospital and I was working as a cancer nurse. Um, we got a call that there was someone who was going to be talking about starting a hospice and we all met in uh, the conference room at Exeter Hospital. Yeah. I've been working in the hospital for several years by that time and especially working in cancer. The hospital wasn't where most of them wanted to be to end their lives. So I knew that hospice was a good alternative. And I, I, once I heard Rosemary talk about hospice and explain what hospice was, it was like, this is the missing piece. The next thing I knew, we were somehow in the basement of the Episcopal Church in a little bitty room. And um, that's where it started. It was something that was lacking, and people see that in hospitals. The doctors are trained, and they're trained to cure. I remember Dr. Hill saying when one of our first meetings that I'm trained to heal, and how hard it was for a doctor to face the fact that their patient is going to die. Luke Hill certainly did galvanize us all when he spoke about it, and he found it more difficult to, or difficult to go in and see a patient and have to tell him there was no more he could help him with. And that is in fact how it began, with uh, volunteers who provided emotional and uh, uh, support to patients and particularly their families in the, in, the, uh, in the event of uh, terminal illness. I'm glad to be here today talking about an organization that I've been involved with since 1979, and I was trained at Seacoast Hospice. And then when Stratford Hospice began, I think that um, although there were volunteers trained to work in Stratford County out of Exeter, the northern part of the county was not well served at all because um, there just weren't people up there and transportation was far. So we wanted to bring that same philosophy of living fully to the end of life and practical support for families um, all over the county. We had a group of volunteers from that group that agreed to serve on the board of directors with us for, for Stratford Hospice. So we wanted to get the message of hospice and the mission of hospice before the before the public and make people aware of the need that we found uh, for patients. Organized medicine, in quotation marks, cannot care for patients in their own homes. They care for patients in hospitals and in doctor's offices. And as I became involved in, um, uh, with physicians and trying to educate them about end-of-life care, it became obvious that a physician in his office could not possibly know what's going on in the patient's home. I kept doing this kind of thing for patients. I'd go and I'd cook and I'd bring food and, you know, and I'd talk to them and bring more food and bring custards and all kind of stuff and, uh, and was happy to see that they were eating it. And uh, when you would have a family that was disintegrating in the, under the stress of having somebody at their home with a, with a terminal illness. And the nurses and social workers would turn that around. It was just dramatic and very, very exciting. And that happened just over and over. The, the volunteers that come into the home and, and help with the, the daily living of, the, of the, um, the whole family and the support there, but they had other services like um, volunteer lawyers that helped us write the will and, and just uh, Everything, anything you asked, they were there, and uh, Seacoast Hospice saved our lives. When my husband died, we used hospice services, and my kids went to the Bridges program. And it literally, they were 10 and 12, and it really made a huge positive impact on their lives after the death of their dad. A lot of people might not be aware that there's something so available so close by at home, and uh, they just have to pick up the phone, and, and you guys are there. 
But I found during that period when Wendy was sick, I'd pick up the phone, I'd call Susan. I'd pick up the phone, I'd call um, Pat Clary. I'd pick up the phone, I'd call Wes. And as often as not, they'd be, be there, not just talk to me on the phone. I mean, Wendy was, Wendy was fun. I was there in the pulmonary uh, specialist or was, was just finished giving Wendy a breathing treatment. And she said, can I get you anything? And Wendy said, a gin and tonic, please. I'm doing this for Wendy. Well, I, I think the future actually is pretty bright for our organization. And uh, one of the things that I think has been a particular value in our particular area is that we have remained independent. And we feel that uh, the communities have supported us wonderfully well. And we hope we'll continue to. I'm Jean Jackson. I'm Dawn McAdam. My name is Peggy Clark. I'm Sue Kamara. I am Madeline Stuckey. My name is Avis Goodwin. I'm Rosemary Coffin. A caring community making a difference every day. We are Seacoast Hospice.